Lately, I've heard a lot of misinformation about the relationship between QT and KD, especially after the video of Baby Huawei that said that KD is not a community company because it relies on QT, which is proprietary, which isn't true simply. So I wanted to dive in the topic a little bit and I won't pretend that this is like easy to understand. It is a bit complex, I'm doing my best to, but I think it's worth it considering that KD relies on QT a lot. I also get asked often, uh, could KD transition to another toolkit? And the answer, as far as I know, and I've seen other developers say this way is, uh, not really, it's very, very unfeasible to think of completely switching to a different toolkit because they are all quite different from what Qt does and Qt provides a lot that's used by KDE. So let's actually talk about Qt. First of all, the KDE Free Qt Foundation, which is a foundation with two members from KDE, two members from Qt, and in case of tie, there's an extra vote as a tiebreaker from KDE. Hey, small correction here, I said Qt, and in this case, I actually refer to the Qt company and not the Qt project. Many people are involved in the Qt project without necessarily being employed by the Qt company. But in order to be in the free Qt, KD Free Qt Foundation, from the Qt side, you do actually have to be employed in the Qt company. And from now on, I'll actually use uh, the word Qt to refer both as the Qt company sometimes and the Qt projects other times. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. So keep in mind this correction when you go through the rest of the video. And the goal of this foundation is to make sure that Qt remains available for development of free software and especially, of course, Qt software. Now, one of the most important results of the Qt Free Qt Foundation is in order to keep there is a relationship stable is of course the software license agreement, which is rather old, but has uh, been updated multiple times. This is the latest version, which is 2015, 2016. And this is an actual agreement contract with a lot of legal stuff that obviously I gone through, I won't go through line by line because it's a lot of legal stuff. But uh, I find that it's nicely explained by this PDF, how the Kitty Free QT Foundation strands uh, Qt, which was actually made by Olaf, which is one of the two members of the Kitty Free QT Foundation from the part of KD. Now, since this document, uh, some things happened, and this is noticed in the document itself. Number one, uh, QD actually said that this text does not fully represent their views. Okay, they did not uh, give specific suggestion for what to change, but also it has not been updated to what happened in 2020 and will get to what happened in 2020. Still, it does give a good uh, overview of what is the agreement, and this I think is one of the most useful graphs. So this is actually, we, we can also see by this graph uh, some of the things that changed through time. As an example, originally there was only a couple of platforms here and others weren't supported, but they were later added. And uh, what the agreement says is that Essential modules and most add-ons have to be licensed through GPL and LGPL. The difference between GPL and LGPL, again, can be better explained by somebody else, but to keep it short, in this video, uh, the main difference is that this license can be used for closed source pro uh, products, meaning that GPL, uh, if you use, uh, release something as GPL and paid, you either do something open source and use GPL and actually follow GPL terms, or you actually pay the commercial, 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 commercial version of Qt. Whereas projects with LGPL can also be used for closed source, uh, closed source pro products. Sorry. So uh, essential modules and most add-ons should be GPL and LGPL or with uh, paid uh, commercial options, of course, which also gives you access to stuff like uh, support, of course. But uh, this is this applies for all of these platforms and does not apply for other platforms, but I mean, everything's in here. 
some add-ons and design and development tools, which should be everything else, can be licensed as GPL, which has the side effect of you have to go and pay for the commercial version if you have a closed source software, of course. And support is paid. But I mean, this paid support also applies to many uh, fully community things, so it makes sense. Now, one very important detail in this agreement is that if this is broken in any way, some uh, module is missing, maybe some essential module is missing LGPL as an example, uh, the contract actually gives a delay of up to 12 months to go back and uh, make sure that this is correctly applied. Another couple of uh, places to read about this is the QT FAQ, which talks about uh, a little bit about the history and what you can and cannot do with LJP LJPL and GPL. And also this is the QT project page, which is not the QT company, but it's actually the project. And uh, this governs the open source development of QT. And you can see that there is a varying number of contributors and everybody can uh, make a Qt account and do uh, a merge request, or I mean, submit a patch. We can see here a lot of details on how to contribute to the Qt project, which is open, gov open governance, as KDE is. You can see here some details about this, the governance model. Now. 2020, what happened, what changed in 2020? This is an article that mostly talks about unrelated things, uh, except this one, which is very much important. Now, I've seen a lot of people saying that LTS become, become proprietary. That didn't quite happen at all. So starting from QD 5.25, uh, sorry, 5.15, I'm used to KD Plasma 5.25 at this point. The long-term support version of Qt uh, will only be available to commercial customers. This means open source users will receive patch level releases of 5.15 until the next minor release will become available. This does not mean that 5.15 uh, again is only available for commercial customers but rather that the patch releases to keep it updated are only released for commercial uh, users. Because what LTS means is that patches that were applied to later versions uh, that came out later are backported to an older version of Qt so that if you use 5.15 LTS, you're sure that you will continue receive updates and bug fixes for a long time, even if newer versions of Qt are available. Now, the LTS version of Qt is more recent than Qt, so there has been a significant portion of time that where uh, Qt lived without the LTS version of Qt, obviously. And even now, it's only used to a little extent within KDE. I think Kubuntu used this in particular. Now, how can they actually do this? Uh, the reasoning is they use, again, this little 12 months thing. So what they do isn't actually make all releases after 5.15.x commercial only, but they do it for a year. So they are actually following the agreement by delaying the open source version by 12 months max, because that is what uh, the contract actually allows to uh, up to 12 months. So this is still within the range of possibility that the contract allows. And this is what happened recently. So recently 5.15.4 was released as open source. And by the way, I'm sorry, I'm using Foronex, but don't use Foronex in general. It's not a good place to get news, but nonetheless, recently 5.15.4 was released and that's because the commercial version of this release was one year ago. So currently for LTS, we are getting patches one year after they're actually published. So to summarize it up, what changes here is that the LTS versions are released immediately. So we do get them 
the major release and when they become LTS. So when a newer one is released and the patches are being backported to 5.15, we do not get those until one year later. So it's not proprietary. It's just that open source is granted until a newer, newer version is out and then you have to wait one year to get back on track. That's the situation with LTS. Then another thing happened uh, still by Olaf, same member that uh, did this document here, uh, which was worrying. This happened on April 8th, 2020, so uh, three months after the, this announcement. And this was related to Corona. You remember like 2020, what a year. And uh, only through him, so he, he is the only source of information because publicly, of course, QT never talked about these internal things. Through him, we know that the company informed both the KDE EV, which is uh, the organization that represents KDE in legal matters, and the KDE Free QT Foundation, that the economic outlook, blah, blah, blah. As a result, they are thinking about restricting all QT releases to paid license holders for the first 12 months. They can do that, again, because we've seen that the contracts the contract actually gives them 12 months to get back on track so they can do this this is probably like the worst way to follow the contract because you do follow it but you make sure that there's as much delay as possible between release of the commercial version and the release of the open source one now if this threat was actually put in place it wasn't but if it were that would have meant that we uh, would have still had an uh, open source version of Qt, but one year later compared to the commercial version, which of course, of course, <laughs> raises the question, what should Qt do in case this happens? Uh, one option is to use Qt open source uh, licensing after one year. Another option, which is always available, is to take the latest version of Qt that has been released under LGPL or LGPL and uh, fork it and maintain it. And this was discussed a lot, more even so in the community of Qt users than developers, even though there has been a lot of discussion back then. And one big question, of course, is would Qt be able to maintain a fork of Qt, because let's remember that Qt cannot close source everything they have. What has been released to open, as open source will remain open source. They cannot change that. They can change the licensing of future versions as we've seen and they can delay it, but what's open source now will remain it. If it's, it gets forked, then we should remember that Qt is not the only organization that actually uses Qt. There are others and some of them back then in 2020 actually step, uh, stood up and said that they would also uh, join an effort to maintain a forked version of Qt if it uh, would have been necessary. It hasn't. Uh, so this remains a what if, what could have been. Right now there is no necessity uh, it's not necessary at all to fork Qt because they are currently following the contract uh, and only the LTS versions are delayed for one year. All the others aren't. So for now, there's no need for a fork. And uh, we should remember that that forking Qt is like the worst case scenario and should be avoided at all costs, obviously. But that's currently not the direction we're going to short term at least. This is not the video to try to make predictions, I'm just trying to explain how it's going. Now, after all of this, what's happening now is a switch to the focus of Qt6. Qt6 has been released, uh, I don't know if you know that. Uh, we're currently at Qt6.3 and Qt is working on the switch from Qt5 to Qt6. Uh, Qt is still Qt5. So one of the things that happened with the switch is, let me show this first, uh, the patch collection. So this was actually supported by both the Qt company and the Qt AV. And it's a set of patches with security and functional fixes uh, that are applied, if I understood this correctly, on Qt 5.15. 
and they are code changes that were applied later on in um, newer, newer versions that weren't backported to 5.15 that we have as open source. And KDE is actually maintaining these set of patches. So they follow the same license as the module that they are applied to. And by doing this, it makes the transition from Qt5 to Qt6 easier by actually con maintaining Qt5.15 until we are ready to switch to Qt6. So you can see that there is still nice collaboration with Qt, the Qt company, and the free Qt Foundation is still maintaining that uh, connection and Qt is following the contract and has always done that, of course, with a 12 months delay trick. Another nice article is in Kate's blog, and it talks about the switch from Qt5 to Qt6, which uh, some people called horrible, <laughs> and uh, saying that the Qt projects and the company doesn't care for their open source and other users, blah, blah, blah. And this article actually goes against that and talks about tra the transi transition from Qt5 to Qt6, saying that it's actually rather easy to switch. Of course, that's it. That's rather technical. We don't care about this right now in this video. And also about the fact that Qt developers do care about other projects. And as an example of this, the merge request that actually helped Kate switch to Qt6, or should I say, be make it possible to compile it with Qt6 because the Kate you're using is still Qt5, was actually submitted by a Qt project contributor and uh, it, it was not just a uh, throwing code at KDE, they actually followed the review, made, made changes according to that, and that's how open, so open source works, so that works. Most of the Qt5 to Qt6 transition is for frameworks, but again, that's another topic for another video, not interesting. What happens if Qt decides to not follow the contract at all? Uh, there are legal consequences, uh, the, the KDE Free Qt Foundation can actually take all of Qt's code and release it as whatever license they prefer. And this would be quite bad news for Qt because it would mean that if you license it as BSD as an example, also close projects that were previously paying Qt to actually use the Qt code would could just take all of, all of the code, the entire entirety of it, and use it in whatever way they prefer. So if Qt breaks the contract, all of Qt code is published under the most permissive license. So there is safety from that point of view. There are some steps that uh, the Qt AV company has to follow before uh, the new license can actually be put into effect. Uh, that is, uh, the foundation have uh, to send a notice to the Qt company and only three months later can the foundation actually be entitled to exercise its right to do the re-license to apply the new licenses. So it's not immediate, but if that happens, a three months notice is sent and after three months, this can actually take uh, effect. Now, this is not the place for me to give my personal opinions about this. It's mostly that I saw really a lot of people asking me to clarify what was happening and a lot of misinformations. Yeah, again, especially done by Baby Bogway, who also claimed that QD cannot be forked. That's not how it works. So this was the goal of this video. Personally, I would like that at least in this community, uh, we stopped, we avoided doing, or rather, should I say, making the situation appear much, much worse than it is. And as much as, of course, these things, especially what happened in 2020, do might seem worrying, even though nothing came out of it and there is currently a good cooperation with the QT company, we should always keep in mind that KD guarantees that everything that you're using under the KDE umbrella and that KDE relies on is open source and 
I've seen people saying that maybe they should switch to GNOME to avoid using proprietary QD. That's not going to happen. KD will never ship based on proprietary QD. That's never going to happen. So KD is a guarantee that what, re, what you're using is free software. And I think that's extremely important and they will do whatever it takes to make sure that it, the code of KDE actually stays completely open source and also what, they, uh, what KDE relies on. And that was the video. These that we're see, seeing right now are the Patreons. And if you would like to help me make these videos and also contribute uh, to KDE regarding my patches. So like I've just done the floating panel and I'm starting to look around. I'm doing some bug fixes right now, but if you'd like to help me out actually do these videos, there is the donation links that will appear short, shortly on my right, which is your left. And you can also go to the KDE.org webpage and there also a way to donate, donate to KDE directly. So you have the choice and uh, Thanks for following along. Just one message for those who watch a lot of my videos. Uh, currently, the Patreons uh, list is wrong. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm still updating it. I need to change the appearance as well. So give me just a little bit of time and I'll make sure that it gets updated. So sorry about that.